Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, point-of-care testing. And uh, to try to give some continuity to the other speakers, the picture on your left is Burkitt's lymphoma, named after Dr. Dennis Burkitt, who was a general surgeon at Malago Hospital in Kampala, Uganda. And the, uh, the guy on the right has about a 650-gram goiter. And these are people who reside on the border of Uganda and the Congo. Um, so the story I'm going to tell kind of starts with this guy who's a four-year-old fellow, um, and he has congenital hypothyroidism. He's short, he has almost no hair, and the hair he has is, is gray. He has a big tongue, his fat lips, his swelling of his extremities. He has a broad-based ataxic gait, and he's mentally retarded. And this is a cretin. Congenital hypothyroidism occurs about one in every 2,800 births. You do not see this in the developed world. Just do not see it. And the reason why you don't see it is because every newborn in the developed world is screened for congenital hypothyroidism. In order to do this, though, they use a really sophisticated infrastructure. And that infrastructure consists of centralized laboratories. This is the Intermountain Central Lab um, in Murray, Utah, a technological palace. Incredibly sophisticated. I can get a cortisol level measured in two hours, any time of the day or night, any day of the week, any week of the year. Incredible. Um, but Tyrannosaurus rex was also a very sophisticated animal. And it was a technological marvel at its time. But the environment changes. And the environment has changed. And centralized laboratories are now becoming dinosaurs. Be and what they're evolving into are smartphones. And I think we've heard a bunch today about how cell phones can do all sorts of interesting things in the developing world. And that's what I'm really going to talk about today. So the word from on high. And that's actually what WHO stands for, um, <laughs> is that we should be moving to point of care testing. And they actually are prescient in this regard. And they've established some criteria for us to do that. Point of care testing should be affordable. It should have great positive and negative predictive value. It should be easier to use. It should be simple to use. And you can use it in any environment. It should not require expensive equipment, such as a quarter million dollar random access immunoassay machine that takes an army to maintain it and requires a humidity and temperature controlled facility and reagent grade water at all times. It's not going to happen. Um, and lastly, you need, to be able to, you need to be able to get the results to people in a timely fashion who need the results. So it turns out that most people recognize that the major barrier to effective health care in Africa is the lack of access to diagnostic testing. So there are three things you need to know before you treat a patient. You need to know the diagnosis, the diagnosis, and the diagnosis. And that's why you need labs. Half a million kids die in Sub-Saharan Africa from congenital syphilis. This is incredibly easy to diagnose, incredibly easy to treat. The cost of the diagnostic test is less than a dollar. It's interesting to look at the distance a person has to travel to get to a clinical laboratory in countries throughout the world. And it's interesting to look at, for example, Uganda, the average distance is about 4.7 kilometers, whereas in other parts of the world, such as Chad or the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, Bolivia, the distance is almost twice as far um, as it is in Uganda. So it's really access to laboratories, access to diagnostic testing, which is the rate limiting step in my mind to providing medical care. So in 1994, I came up with a way to um, screen for congenital hypothyroidism anywhere in the world. And that was to adapt a pregnancy test format for the measurement of TSH. So what people do now in the developed world is they put a drop of blood on a piece of filter paper, and they send it to a centralized laboratory, which assays the results. And then if it's positive, i.e. over 20, they 
transmit the results back to the healthcare provider where that baby is. So this requires a ginormous amount of infrastructure. A, you have to have filtered paper. B, you have to have a postal service or some way to get it there. C, you have to have a central lab. And D, you have to be able to get the results back. So let's say that you are a Kalahari Bushman who's wandering around the desert. It's tough to get back to those people. It just is not gonna work. But with a point of care TSH assay, you can in fact measure TSH within a matter of minutes. And that's what's shown in this, um, in this series of drawing, in this series of pictures. So in the upper left-hand corner, um, you see my assistant who actually was a resident in general surgery at Malago Hospital, um, collecting a couple of drops of heel, of heel blood from a three-day-old baby, putting it onto a plastic cassette. And then the way these things work, and I'm gonna go into this in a little bit of detail, is if TSH is above a predefined level, you'll get two lines. If it's less than that, you'll get one line. And these are so-called immunochromatographic assays, the best known of which is the home pregnancy test. And they all work the same way. So if you start down at the sample pad, you put some blood or some urine or some saliva or some plant washings, whatever your biological matrix you want to measure things in on a sample pad. And it wicks up a microcellulose membrane, just like water will wick up a paper towel. So the first thing that goes past are some soluble antibodies that have been labeled with colloidal gold. And if you look at the um, lower right hand insert in that, you'll see those labeled as kind of those red donuts with Ys sticking up to them. So the mobile phase antibody will recognize one epitope on your antigen in the case of TSH, one epitope on TSH, HCG, whatever. And then it continues to wick along a membrane and then it goes past a, a place on the membrane where antibodies have been covalently bound to the membrane. And you can see that labeled as the capture test line. And those antibodies recognize a, diff a different epitope. So that if the antigen that you want to detect is present, you'll form a sandwich. So you have the solid phase antibody, the thing you want to measure like TSH, and then the mobile phase antibody to which has been attached, to which colloidal gold has been attached. And the colloidal gold gives you a visual signal. You can see it, okay? That's how immunochromatographic assays, such as home pregnancy tests and every other immunoassay works. So this is a common situation. Um, here's a, a woman who did a pregnancy test and she took a picture of it and she's trying to convince her friends that she's pregnant so she marked the test line and says, you can see the line, can't you? HCG is there, I know it is, I can see it. So after you've done a couple of thousand of these tests, you realize that there's a lot of information in that test line. Specifically, the concentration of colloidal gold varies as a function of the concentration of analyte. So you can in fact quantify these semi-quantitative test results. So I'm gonna to turn to the serious engineers in the audience because they're gonna get a kick out of this. So normally when you show a picture of a sunset, it means you're done talking, but that's not why I'm showing this picture. I'm showing this picture to introduce the concept of raleigh mee light scattering. And raleigh mee light scattering describes optical properties which occur when light of various wavelengths bounces off various particles. So the reason why clouds are white is because the wavelength of light is pretty close to the, wave, to the size of the particles off which it's bouncing. Hence, all the light is equally scattered. And when you scatter all light equally, you end up with a white color. That's why clouds are white. I know that I probably oversimplified that, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, so by using elastic light scattering, one can in fact quantify the signal in an immunochromatographic assay. And so to test that hypothesis, um, I conducted the following experiment, where I looked, I varied the angle of incidence of UV light and the angle of capture of UV light, and then looked at the ratio of those two, um, bouncing it off of a test line on an immunochromatographic assay to see whether or not I couldn't 
position it in such a way to maximize the signal. And you can see in that data that yes, in fact, at an angle of about 45 degrees, I get a very robust signal, okay? So that's the proof of principle that um, we can optimize signal detection by using light scattering in order to measure the concentration of colloidal gold in a lateral flow immunochromatographic assay. And so what we did was to then build a gizmo, and gizmo is a technical term for medical device, that holds a immunoassay at a particular angle to a smartphone camera and flash so that we can control the angle at which the test is illuminated and the angle at which the light is captured. And that's illustrated in this cartoon. And the proof of the pudding is in the data. And this is the kind of data we can collect um, with this device showing that we have sufficient functional sensitivity to detect a suppressed TSH, which is how you diagnose hyperthyroidism, and an elevated TSH to detect hypothyroidism. And in the range of about 0.5 to 40, the signal that's generated is linear. So that by using a cell phone camera, we're able to quantify a semi-quantitative immunochromatographic assay. And it turns out that one of the individuals in this audience is responsible for the picture in the lower left-hand corner, and that person is not me. Um, but this shows how we've reduced this device to practicality, and this is a list of all the tests that currently can be done using this technology. Now, inventing is a chronic disease, and you either have it or you don't, and sometimes it goes into remission and sometimes it relapses. But it's a chronic disease. So having figured out a way to do immunoassays on a smartphone, I then began to think about what else we might be able to do. And the next set of slides talk about using smartphones as microscopes. Remember that the microscope, as we currently know it, was invented in 1630, 1676 by von Leeuwenhoek. It's amazing to me to think that we are using today a technology that's 400 years old. I mean, it's a great technology, but really, there have been some advances in engineering over the past 400 years. Um, so the woman on the left side of that slide is a technician at a private hospital in North Kivu in the Congo. And she is using the one piece of equipment in this laboratory, that microscope. And you probably have not seen a microscope like that unless you're over the age of 50. And you probably last saw it in your eighth grade high school biology class. You'll notice that the illumination consists of a mirror that she has to angle to capture the sun, to try to see whether or not a peripheral smear is infected with malaria parasites. And that's what she's doing. You can do the same sort of imaging with a smartphone. And it's based upon a technique called optofluidic microscopy. Optofluidic microscopy uses, uses a field called microfluidics or moving small volumes of, of fluid around on a microscope type slide or on a piece of paper or on an, an injection molded piece of plastic into which you've etched channels. And then using a, a derivative of a CMOS chip, that's like the next generation CCD, to image, the, uh, to image whatever you have on your microfluidic chip. And the advantages of this is that it provides you with three-dimensional three imagery. Based upon the wavelength you use, you can look for all sorts of things, such as fluorescent labeled antibodies, so that you can detect, for example, viruses or bacteria with fluorescently labeled antibodies. Um, you don't get distortion of the image, so it's really easy, or I should say not really easy, but easier to do image analysis. 
you can have the cells flow by so that you can do flow cytometry with your cell phone, okay? And you can also monitor whether or not these cells that you're imaging are changing in size. You can tell if they're growing. You can tell if they're sensitive to antibiotics with your smartphone. And here's another picture of, for all the geneticists or laboratorians in the audience who use C. elegans to do their genetic research. So on the top is a standard image of C. elegans with a light microscope, and on the bottom is a picture of C. elegans with a optofluidic cell phone-based microscope. And you can see how good the resolution is. Okay, so, you know, it's amazing to me that we've been talking about international health in the developing world, and we have not talked about malaria yet. Even though trauma causes more deaths in the developing world than TB, AIDS, and malaria combined, we still have to at least mention the word malaria if we're talking about the developing world. So I want to show you how an optofluidic microscope connected to a cell phone can diagnose malaria. And so in the top panel, panel A, what you see are red blood cells infected with malaria parasites. And in the bottom panel B, you see non-infected red cells. Clearly there's a difference. And then for comparison is a, the gold standard, a light microscope image of the same two infected versus non-infected red cells. So in fact, you can use an optofluidic microscope connected to a cell phone to diagnose malaria in the same way that the woman I showed you from North Kivu in the Congo was using a 400-year-old technology to diagnose malaria. So in summary, why should you use a smartphone as a clinical laboratory? Firstly, because it can do a lot of tests. And, you know, I promised Ray Price that I would develop a test for SGOT, SGPT, amylase, and bilirubin, and alkaline phosphatase. So I have to do that. Um, I've already shown you data that I can do immunoassays. And we currently have working in prototype a, um, a way to do white counts and differentials on your cell phone with five microliters of capillary blood. Um, it provides immediate results, by which I mean that a random access immunoassay machine at Intermountain Medical Center takes about an hour and 10 minutes to give you results. Using a immunoassay cassette read by a smartphone takes about 17 minutes. So in fact, the results are faster when you do it as a point of care test. You can also build into that um, what's called decision support, i.e. it can tell you how to interpret the tests and what to do about it. You can also put in there ticklers to remind you to recheck things, okay? Like a peripheral brain, it can really help. Um, you know, these smartphones, they're cameras and they're computers, and they're also communications devices. So you can then take this data and you can send it to any database you want with a date, time, and GPS stamp. So for example, you could go to a strawberry field and you can wash the leaves of the strawberry plant, and then you could test those washings for the presence of E. coli, toxic E. coli. And you could send those results right to a database, and that database could plot for you exactly where the E. coli are located in that field by using GPS coordinates. This is like the basis of epidemiology. Um, lastly, and most importantly, you don't need any infrastructure. And, you know, we heard a lot about how it's so impossible to get things in hospitals in Ghana or in hospitals in Uganda. And that's true, but I'm interested in delivering medical care to places where people's only technology is their antelope skin loincloth. And there's a lot of people like that. And this allows you to check a patient's white count where all, the only technology is an antelope loincloth. And that to me is really, really important. And the interesting thing is that when people realize that a technology is inexpensive, robust, and gives you clinical relevant information, 
in the third world, it's going to migrate back to the first world. And I predict that this technology is going to end up being one of the engines of healthcare reform because what we have now is non-sustainable and nutty. You don't need to have a precision to the 10,000th when you measure TSH. It's clinically irrelevant. So sacrifice precision, which is clinically irrelevant, for clinically important information. And that's why these technologies are going to make centralized laboratories like dinosaurs go obsolete. So this has been a, a talk about disruptive technologies. So I thought I would end with a slide of an endocrine disruptor. Thank you very much. Thank you.